Hi, my name is Mike Aben, and welcome to episode 31 of my beta campaign. Despite Kerbal going full release, I am still here finishing off this campaign, trying to bring it to an ending so that I can get ready to start into my own 1.0 experience. And this episode is going to be about bringing my Kerbals home, all my Kerbals that I have in space. But right here, what I have is the Kepler. And the Kepler I launched a couple of days ago, or a couple of episodes ago, I'm sorry. And it is a unmanned Moho lander. Now, it's still over 13 days from its launch window to get it to go to Moho. Um, but I, I had a bit of an idea that's going to make my eventual launch easier. Um... This this particular craft has two stages on it right now. Um, the main vessel itself is uh, propelled by an ion drive. Uh, and uh, that, of course, does not provide a whole heck of a lot of thrust. So what I have is a lower stage that is powered by a monopropellant, whose job it is to just sort of give it its escape velocity, get it out of Kerbin's sphere of influence. But... Because those two things are working together and the burn, even once you're out of the Kerbin sphere of influence to get down to Moho is actually fairly long, this can this will turn into a fairly long burn. So what I'm going to do to try and um, make this burn a little bit more efficient because the further away you get from periapsis in your burn, the less efficient your burn becomes. It would be perfect if you could just burn it all right away right off the bat but um, unfortunately that's not going to work so what I'm going to do is this my my burn is 13 days and one and a half hours away so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a part of the burn right now and all I'm simply going to do is push up my apoapsis while keeping track of how far away it is and when my apoapsis gets to be about half of the distance to my node so that would be about six and a half days and then another 45 minutes. Then, um, by the time the spacecraft does that elongated eccentric orbit, gets out to Apoapsis and comes back, it will be about 13 days, 1.5 hours later, time and just in time for its moho window. But by then I will have done a good portion of my burn, close to about half of my burn, um, and then I can, uh, burn the rest of it on that thrust-limited ion drive. And I, and I know this sounds confusing, and in fact, if you take a look at the maneuver node next to the nav ball, it's, it's completely confused. KSP doesn't understand what the heck I'm doing right now. But a little later on, I'll come to the second half of this burn, and, uh, you'll see that it's going to make a little bit more sense. So again, all I'm doing is I'm watching my time to apoapsis, and I'm just waiting for that time to get to about oh, a little over six days. So that when I swing around, um, see, it's six days and 45 minutes. So that when I swing around, I'll be ready for my proper launch window. Now, the one thing I did notice after doing this is that that orbit does cross the moon's orbit, which can be a bit of a concern because if the moon gets involved in this, it could completely mess up this trajectory. But given where the moon is right now, um, that's not going to be an issue. Uh, though I think if I did this again in the future, I would probably only burn up, I'd do this burn a little later and then only burn to my apoapsis so that my apoapsis stays less than the altitude of the moon's orbit so this doesn't get messed up. Now this did mess up that maneuver, that maneuver now doesn't make any sense so I had to go and tweak that maneuver again, but then it's just simply a matter of uh, setting an alarm for that maneuver uh, in the future and... Uh, We'll revisit this particular mission later, and hopefully when you see the two halves of this together, it'll make more sense. Yes, because this episode's not supposed to be about unmanned missions. It's supposed to be about getting Kerbals home. And to help us do that, we have this unmanned mission. Well, but this unmanned mission is going to help us get some Kerbals home. What we have here is a carbonite refinery, and it's on its way to our moon base. If you recall, we have Tom Plock and Genimal on the surface of the moon with a lander that doesn't have enough fuel to get itself into lunar orbit. So this is there to help it. Now, to be honest, it would have been easier and cheaper just to simply fly up a tank of fuel. But 
The plan for that moon base was always to have it become a refinery for manufacturing fuel to support science recovery on the moon. Now, I'm, I'm abandoning that idea because I'm going to be closing down this campaign, but this particular mission was already in the building queue at the time, so it didn't make any sense not to launch it. So it's going to go over to the moon, and uh, it's going to refine carbonite, and it's going to convert that into rocket fuel for our kerbals that are there. So, standard insertion into low Kerbin orbit, transfer over to the moon. I've landed a number of things over at the uh, moon base before. There was an episode where you saw me do it again and again and again, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time, though I do feel, if you look here, I, I'm slowly, very slowly getting better at getting my uh, vessels there on target. Now, I do apologize for having to do this landing at night, but the thing is I wanted to get this refinery down and creating fuel as quickly as I could because I want to get this over with. And I'm not in the best of carbonite locations. I sort of messed up reading the map. Uh, I think the percentage of carbonite in the uh, regolith here is about 0.7% or something like that, which uh, seemed to be high as I was sort of scrolling around because I really didn't know what that was you know, what that number really meant, until I started finding isolated spots where it was about 10 times that. So I really have no idea how long it's going to take to refine the carbonite, so I just wanted to get started. But anyway, now that we're down, we got to hook up some power to it, so we're going to hook this onto our nuclear grid, and then it's time to just start the drill and start to take in the carbonite and, uh, yeah, it started, you know, it, it started bringing in the carbonite a little quicker than, uh, than I thought it was going to. I was pleasantly surprised by this. But let us leave Tom Plock and Gentlemen for now to their efforts to refine fuel from out of the moon's crust and return again to the Kepler, which earlier in this video I had set up uh, into an eccentric orbit so that it would return to periaps in time for its transfer burn out to Moho. And all of this is about maximizing the Oberth effect so that you spend as much of your time during your burn close to the parent body, which in this case is Kerbin. Because the closer you are to your periapsis, the faster you're going and the more energy you're going to be getting out of your burn. So we start off burning off some of that RCS fuel just to give us a final kick to get us out of the Kerbin sphere of influence. We ditch that with the plan of returning to it. It still has some fuel left in it. Uh, and then we complete our burn with the ion uh, engine that is on the main probe itself, which has a very, very high uh, ISP, but a very, very low uh, thrust. Now you might recall several episodes I had sent another ion powered probe on its way to a closer encounter with the Sun and uh, that thing I spent a lot of time burning and by the time I finished my burn I was quite a ways out from Kerbin but as you can see here by the time I finished this transfer burn I was still relatively close to Kerbin so I was able to make this burn much more efficient which is good because I'm going to need all the Delta V I can get in order to get my capture of Moho. Uh, if you recall last last episode, we, we did a flyby of Moho, and you saw how fast I was going. Now I have to kill off most of that velocity, so I'm gonna need that Delta V to, to get into a uh, low Moho orbit, and this thing is supposed to land as well. But that is going to have to be, obviously, for a future episode. For now, it's time to return to the moon and see if we can not take the carbonite that we have extracted from the moon's crust and convert it into some liquid fuel and oxidizer. So we start the conversion process, and this goes along pretty quickly, and it's not too long until we uh, have taken all of that carbonite and converted it into liquid fuel and oxidizer, and all that remains to be seen is to see if that is going to be enough. So we reconnect the Tycho back up to the uh, 
moon base and so that we can uh, com transfer the fuel on over. And in fact, not only is it enough, it's more than enough. We completely fill the tanks on the Tyco. So with that job done, we disconnect the Tyco from the base, get Tom Plock and Genimal on, on over there, and head on out. Now, uh, the, the uh, target, the place we're going to be going, is the Kanata station that's in lunar orbit. And it's at an orbit of about uh, uh, 50 kilometers. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to let it get well ahead of me and put the Tyco into an orbit of around 12 kilometers. And, uh, you know, being in the lower orbit, I should be moving faster, so I'll catch up to the Kanata, and that should allow me to do a, a uh, transfer burn and get myself out to the Kanata. Now, this thing has actually more than enough fuel to get these guys back into low Kerbin orbit, but... Um, this lander cannot land on Kerbin. That's not going to work. It doesn't have any parachutes or anything like that. It doesn't even have a heat shield. Uh, I could aero break it into a low Kerbin orbit and then uh, get on over to the Hipparchus station, which is in, in and around Kerbin. But that station, if you recall, has four Kerbals on it already. I don't want to add two more to the mix. That's going to make that pretty crowded. Now, that might end up actually still being the simplest thing for me to do, but... I have another plan for getting these guys home. I do want to show, I want to build one more ship. Uh, one more ship to really sort of take advantage of some of the technology that I've unlocked. And as Tom Plock and Genimal get themselves reacquainted with the Kanata station, it's time for us to meet the final new build of this series. And here it is. This is the Kepler. And the Kepler is a nuclear powered Kerbin system shuttle. I had always intended on building something like this at some point, and I thought, you know what, um, why don't I get this thing built and at least be like a proof of concept type of idea and use it to go out there and get Tom Pop and Genimal. So as I mentioned, this is a nuclear powered vessel, well not right now actually, the lifter is just a um, regular chemical rocket, though it does have three mainsails there on the bottom, so it's probably the biggest lifter, not probably, it definitely is the biggest lifter I've bought, uh, built so far in this particular campaign, but that's because that nuclear reactor is freaking heavy. And another thing about this thing that makes it a little bit unusual is I'm making use of a, of a cockpit from B9 Aerospace that uh, you'll see in a second, but I haven't used yet, but somehow it's kind of messing up uh, my KOS launch script. I, I don't know what it is, so I'm actually being forced to fly this thing manually, which is not a bad thing. It's it's good to get keep the keep practice in there and make sure I can still do it. And you can see that at the helm there we have uh, Robel as our pilot with her co-pilot, the scientist Lunny. Um, pick because they are my least experienced purples so far. So <laughs> they haven't got out towards the moon yet. So I thought, you know what, they deserve to make this particular trip. But uh, let's go to cut along and pop this fairing and uh, take a look inside and take a look at this cockpit. I love this cockpit. This is the M27 cockpit and just check out the view from the inside. I mean this is freaking gorgeous. No tiny little windows. You can see everything all around you. It's got this great attachment point at the front for you to attach uh, 1.25 meter parts and it comes with this special um, sort of scaffolding structure that you can see. I have a docking port at the front of it but you can see right in front of you. It's a, it's a brilliant cockpit. And, you know I kind of have mixed feelings when it comes to um, B9, the B9 Aerospace mod because with 1.0 now out and their improvements to all of the space plane and aerodynamic parts, um, so much of that overlaps with what B9 does. But B9 comes with so many cool parts, like 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 this one right here. That uh, uh, there's just no equivalent for it. So I'll have to put some thought into what I'm going to do when I go to a 1.0 campaign and and how I'm going to incorporate if or if I'm going to incorporate B9 in there. But if I do let it go, it's it's with some trepidation. So let's talk a little bit about this vessel because it's got a number of parts on it that I haven't used yet in this campaign. So towards the back there, the uh, large cylindrical object, that is the nuclear reactor. It's a fission reactor like uh, the other ones I've used, running on uranium nitride. And then attached to the back of that is a thermal rocket. So like the thermal rocket, the LVN9, or the LVN thermal nuclear rocket, which is uh, the stock rocket 
stop nuclear rocket with KSP, what it's doing is it's taking the propellant, heating it up in the reactor, and ejecting it out the back for thrust. Now what's a little bit different about this is what we're using as propellant. It's not liquid fuel and oxidizer. It's not monopropellant or anything like that. It's water. In those large rectangular containers, uh, there's three of them on this particular vessel, those contain just water. And you can actually use a lot of different types of propellants with uh, the Interstellar mod. It, it gives you quite a lot of options on what you can use, but I found yeah, and they all have different combinations when it comes to ISP and thrust, but I found water for this vessel worked really, really well, so I kind of went with the water, and I like the idea that it's working on water. Now, ahead of those water tanks is the six-man crew capsule, and it's got so much cool features. Here, watch this. Watch. Look at the window, and you can close the shutter. I mean, isn't that cool? I think that's cool. You know, so if the passengers, I don't know, it's, if they want to take a nap and the sun's shining through there, they can close the door or close the shutter there and, and have themselves a little nap. It's, it's little touches like that that I find so neat. So this thing, uh, you know, has a pilot and a co-pilot that are at the front in, in the cockpit, and then it can take up to six passengers in the back. So uh, where we're going to go, we're going to go to the moon. So uh, play around. We'll take another look at the interior. And in fact, why don't we switch it over to the targeting computer. There we go. And we'll select our target this way. So we're going to target the moon, of course. That's kind of fun doing this stuff internally. Again, another reason why I really like this mod. There we go. Go to the moon. Now, let's see. What can I put this screen to? The, uh, the altitude graph doesn't really make sense. Cameras does. I don't have any external cameras. Oh, the internal. Oh, that's nice. There we go. Nice view out the front. So that's great. Now, another thing I did with this vessel is tucked in there amongst the hot water tanks in the middle of all that well, hot water tanks or just water tanks, for goodness sakes, is a thermal electric generator as well. So um, the thermal electric generator is running off a pittance of the thermal energy that's being uh, generated by that nuclear reactor. And uh, that's providing all the electricity and more that this craft needs. So this craft actually has no solar on it whatsoever. And as we get ready for the transfer burnout to the moon, we get a good look at the business end of this particular vessel. You can also see the uh, three radiators that I have extended. Uh, those radiators aren't just there for looks. The uh, nuclear generator is generating a lot of heat, and we need to radiate that out into space. And there we go. Yeah, see our acceleration. Our acceleration is around 8.2 meters per second squared, which really ain't too bad for such a, a heavy vessel powered by a nuclear uh, nuclear thermal rocket. It certainly outperforms the nuclear thermal rocket that's the stock one. Uh, so yeah, I, I can't complain about this, and it's more than adequate. I mean, it's almost a G, and that's more than adequate to get us out to the moon and and be able to navigate efficiently. And with our transfer burn complete, we'll just warp on out to the sphere of influence change and... Wait, what's this? Dangerous overheating detected. Emergency reactor shutdown occurring now. Ooh, that doesn't sound good. Oh yeah, look at that waste heat. It's almost up to... I mean, it's cooling down now, but it was clearly up to the top. So that's clearly what just happened. Oh man, okay. Obviously, I didn't put enough or big enough radiators on this thing now 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 in my defense i'm going to keep i'm going to defend myself right away in my defense the thermal helper that's supposed to help you with this kind of stuff in the vab wasn't working with me now uh in my uh to my decrement uh i didn't do much to try and fix the situation i thought oh well what the hell with it i'll just kind of make a guess at it yeah, I clearly guessed wrong. And, you know, I really didn't have to guess either because, I mean, in the VAB, they tell you what the thermal output is of these nuclear reactors and they tell you what the ability of these radiators to radiate the heat away. All I had to do was put those numbers together. Oh, shoot. So, the nuclear reactor is not working, which probably means my engine's not working. And I am on a hyperbolic trajectory past the moon. That's not a good situation in which to be.
Um, yeah, and these guys, I think there's only about 14 days of food and life support in here because I was never expecting this thing to be out for very, very long. Oh, this is not a good thing. I'll never be able to build another one. So I got, I got a choice. Um, I could, I could try and get them back to Kerbin, but you know, maybe, maybe this thing will cool down enough by the time I get to the moon and to the closest approach that I can uh, fire that reactor up again. So here I am approaching my, or coming up to my closest approach. I've opened up that reactor system interface window so I can take a look at what's going on while I'm burning. And there's the burn. And there's a lot of flame coming out the back, but if you take a look at the acceleration, it's only in around about 0.4 meters per second squared. I mean, one G's like 10 meters per second squared about, or 9.8 meters per second squared, really. But what, what are we talking about? Like a 20th, a 25th of a G? I mean, that's that's worse than ion drive territory for my ion drive probes. Jeez. So, the, so yeah, I'm not getting much out of this. And now I'm really worried whether I can even get a capture. I mean, I need to get a capture. If I don't get a capture, these guys end up leaving the moon system and ending up in some big orbit in and around Kerbin or heaven forbid in interplanetary space I'll never be able to build another craft to get out there and to, to, to rescue them in time like these guys are doomed and I'm seeing that decay heating when I open up this window and, and, and then actually after the fact I ended up looking up in the interstellar documentation at their wiki a little late you know, maybe I should try doing that thing before I start playing with all these parts. But I learned this, that when the nuclear reactor shuts itself down, it is still producing some heat from decay heating. Um, and this heat is coming from the byproducts of the fission reactor uh, decaying radioactively, because they're radioactive. And that's producing a heat, but it's less than 10% of the thermal output of this, re of this uh reactor normally. So that's why I'm getting such a pitiful amount of thrust. Now right here I sent out Lunny to see if she could, in some desperate attempt, see if I could figure out if I could sh fire up this reactor. But all this is in vain. This reactor is not going to fire up. Now I did notice on that uh, reactor system interface that you'll see when we get back into the ship that there is a, a lifetime, it says there are 0.39 days. Now that's, there's no way that there's only 0.39 days of fuel left in this thing. So I'm thinking that that's probably the amount of time of decay heating I have left. So that means in about 0.4 days, which isn't really all that long, it's just, you know, a few hours, uh, this nuclear reactor could probably be fired up again, but then what? What? I mean, it overheated in just a few hours. Now, if I kept the engine running, actually, it, that helps it to actually keep cool because the engine's throwing heat out the back. But I can't keep the engine going all the time. And uh, so this thing's just going to overheat every few hours. And then have to wait and then another three or four hours for it to cool down again. I mean, that's useless. <sighs> what I need to do is I need to just get a capture. That's what this is now all about. See if I can get a capture, then... I have some time to explore what options I have, but it's looking very much like instead of having the two Kerbals, Tom Plock and General, that need rescuing, it looks very much like I now have four Kerbals in around the moon that are going to need rescuing. So here I am, about a minute later, still burning, watching that apoapsis height, waiting for it to go pause it, and there it goes. Whew, so there you go, I got my capture. So that's a, a bit of a weight off my shoulders. Um, now it's just about, let's see how unacentric I can make this. Let's try and bring this eccentricity down to a point where at least this orbit looks a little bit normal. And after about another two and a half minutes of burning, I decided that was good enough. Decided to call this and get it into this. So th they're in a stable orbit. I know where they're going to be for the next little while, and they got 14 days in order to get them off of this ship, get them somewhere safe. But clearly, international rescue here has failed, and the rescuers are now in need of a rescue. But that's going to have to be for another episode. So, I hope to see you then.